spoken they. I haven't thought about flying for a long time. I haven't dreamed of that moment when I was alone above the clouds for a long time. I have dreamed of waking up in a room surrounded in blue and green grass for more years than I could dream of memory. I haven't walked back into the past or scratched on the doors of my origins, where it all came from, since I held up that cape for the last time. Return to Kent Town 10th year anniversary edition is a revised version of Andy Ann's first poetry book. The book can be purchased from Amazon and it contains numerous additional material. Spoken Label Hi, it's Andy Ann from Spoken Label. Thank you today for streaming or downloading another episode of Spoken Label. Spoken Label was originally set up on the beginning of 2016 and as of speaking has currently nearly 300 sessions. The full archive is available on Spoken Label full stop bandcamp.com although it is available for free for stream and download if you wish. I am always grateful for any sort of kind of donation to enable me to keep the running costs of this podcast going and enjoy. Take care. Bye bye. Spoken label. Hi guys, at the end, spoken label back in the house. We're on Zoom again today. Over to America again now. There's a good story behind this one and I'm going to make the little young lady blush in a minute as well on this. I've got on with us today. Now, I've got me the Manchester with me. Now, you might notice by the surname straight away one reason why I wanted to get her on today because this cause is Manchester and I'm actually a lady called who said in Manchester and I live in Manchester. So, great combination. But Mina um, contacted me, didn't you, Mina, a couple of weeks ago about one of your clients? That's right, I did. Carol Oren, who I think you spoke with, um, yep. also Sp- for the podcast, yeah. Mm. Lovely lady. And now, what happened to Mina and Mina is Mina, as well as being a writer and various other aspects, which we want to talk about today, is also, a, you, you do PR and you're an agent, you do all kinds of other things as well, don't you? And I was reading your work and I really enjoyed it. And I thought to myself, well, I had a great time chatting to Carol. I thought, well, we'll get Mina on at the same time just after. So and I thought it made sense. Now, Mina, obviously, we've got a lot to talk about today here. So obviously, do you want to introduce yourself to everybody, first of all? Tell them, obviously, where you come from and what started you off in your creative journey. And we'll start from there. Absolutely. And I just want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for for having me on. Um, It's really an honor and uh, to be in the great company of all the other artists that you've spoken with over time. And it, it really is a service to the community to have, you know, people being able to speak about their creative journey. So thank you. Um, well, I'm, I'm Mina Manchester, um, like Andy said, and uh, I'm coming to you from just outside of Los Angeles, and I'm an editor at large for the literary journal Five South, and I'd be remiss in not uh, encouraging you to go check it out. We have a fiction contest if you'd like to submit your work, and uh, we have our issue three coming out in September, so look for that. Uh, but some really amazing up-and-coming writers there, that, and we and we really want to submit support uh, emerging writers who aren't widely published yet. Um, and I'm also an MFA student at the Suwannee School of Letters out in Tennessee, which is on oh. Zoom right now. And uh, so it, it's nice. I feel like I'm a lifelong learner, but you know, I think Andy and I were talking just before this interview started and he said he, he started writing poetry around the age of 10. And I, I was the same. I started writing little stories when I was about 11. Wow. So it's, it's wow. been a journey for me as well. well I've got to ask you then, and I'm just about you, of course, but my second ever poem got me into two week detention at school. It did. <laughs> because I, know, I want to find out what your work, your early work was like as well. Where I wrote a poem about uh, after work on a school trip. And I remember as well because um, I wrote yesterday, write a poem about it, I'll trip to the, zoo, to the zoo. And mine was, I said, Oh, but when the lion broke at the cage at the teacher, I didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like that very much. That's smart. That's so smart. And that's so that's so great. And that's a story, right? That was a poem. You know? that, was a poem. that was a poem. I didn't like that very much. <laughs> that's great. I mean, I think that 
when you have those experiences, it's like, there's something that you want to say, there's something you want to express and certain, you know, usually children, it comes out in us and, and you know, pretty early on, I think. Um, but I love that. And I love that you're just pushing at the borders and trying to do something edgy um, because I don't think we have enough of that right now in writing. And I'm so excited when I come across something that is the lion coming out of the cage and eating the teacher, you know, or, or scared the teacher because it's weird and it's interesting. You know, I, I read a lot of stories that are so similar and it's early on, you know, a lot of people, you know, we come to this and we, we are practicing our craft, but uh, the weirder and the stranger, the better. Yeah, I agree with you completely with that. So, now obviously then, you've covered a lot of ground, I think, over time. So, now, obviously, when you said you were writing your stories when you were 11, did you, what led you into into editing and getting involved in magazines? Say, for example, like Five South, I mean, you used to do work, you used to be the former assistant editor for Narrative Magazine as well, didn't you? Yes, yes, and, and Narrative also has a pretty big UK presence as well. Um, well, you know, as, as a kid, I was uh, sort of a precocious child who always liked to read and sort of escape the craziness of my family. And then I went to college and I did the sensible thing. I was like, okay, I'm going to, you know, get a degree so I can go to job and, you know, make some money and take care of myself and pay the bills. And somewhere along the way, a few years into this, my boyfriend at the time said, you know, you're kind of going to parties and, and getting a little tipsy and doing some journaling and I don't think you're very happy. And he was like, you know, you're going to have to take a writing class or I'm breaking up with you. And <laughs> I kind of oh, liked the it. guy. So I said, yes, I would do it. And uh, I took a writing class and then dear reader, you know, never stopped writing and I married the guy too. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you stuck me no matter what then basically. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant brilliant then with that so yeah I kind of keep, and obviously when you took the writing course it just let just led onwards in your life and didn't it really so because like it's if people look at your website they can you can see straight away the amount of different kinds of things you're involved in straight away and it's like you've like I also was I was really impressed for example of like you've had work published in Huff Post as well Tell us about the experience of working in, with HuffPost. Because I've, re I've read a lot of the table of HuffPost. I love it. Great place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think early on, I took a writing class uh, at a place called The Writing Salon in San Francisco. They have, they have online classes, too. I highly recommend it. And many of the people who've taken classes there have gone on to win, you know, push cards and be nominated for O. Henry. So, so do take a class with them and they're affordable too, which I really stress that's important. I know a lot of writers are, you know, trying to have the day job too. And I get that, um, you know, and, and I just kept doing it. And the first 10 years, I have to say, what a slog to borrow, to borrow the UK term. I mean, just really, I think I felt like a fraud, you know, most of that time. Um, I felt like, you know, they say that we have like imposter syndrome, you know, that's something that women suffer from. I think that's something that everyone suffers from because you're just, you're sort of making this art by yourself in your room. No one's reading it really. So I took a couple workshops with teachers and uh, really started to go through the workshop process. And that was so helpful because basically people just said, this is, this is crap. This is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Straight to the point. <laughs> I mean, seriously, no. And, and, and it was, and I was, you know, I was in my early twenties. I didn't have much life experience yet, you know, and uh, I think it was just learning, you know, and I needed outside people who were better than me to point me to the things I couldn't see in the work. Um, and I was also, I was working like 60 hours a week, you know, doing my day job and traveling a bit and, and, you know, trying to have a life. I, I, like I said, I'm married. So putting time into my, you know, my marriage and, and I have two kids now, um, that's important to me. So, and, and I think it actually helps me because it supports me when I have those days where, you know, sometimes I get a rejection a day you know, from a, from a lit journal or a fellowship I wanted or a residency, my God, my, the walls to glory are paved with rejection letters. Let me tell oh, you. Oh yeah, completely. I can well relate to that where for every, I've, I've tell me if you agree with this, every this acceptance you get, you must have upwards like me, probably a hundred, 200 rejections. 
Yes, yes, that is literally my number. I get a hundred rejections for every acceptance. Yeah. And that's so discouraging, you know, and I think when I talk with writers who are just starting out, I say, who's, who's your team? Who's on your team? Because it's those times when I'm, you know, crying in the shower that, you know, my kid or my husband or my mom will say, it's okay, you know, keep doing it. And, you know, my mom always says, this is really good uh, for you because then when you do succeed later, you, you won't be an ego case about it. You know, you'll, you'll really have humility because you'll really struggle and you'll have empathy. And, and I think that's right. I think it's, it's about knowing how hard it is and, and also to support others as much, you know, put into your community as much as you're taking out. I believe in that. Yeah, the same here. I believe you as well. Like it's that's we were talked for last podcasting and, and journalism is it's something I've got into later on in life and it came almost by accident. So am I right in thinking you're you're for I get the word right here, you're entering editing with people and stuff like that, I'm doing the PR. Where did all that come from then? Did that come by chance like me, did it really, and built up over time? I think so. I think it came you know, I think it was sort of a snowball. Like I had a few writers who I, I was desperate to take classes with. I basically begged them <laughs> to work with me. <laughs> and, and, you know, a few said yes, begrudgingly. And then, you know, they gave me great advice and they pushed me to take a workshop or to travel. You know, I went to the Kenyan Review writing workshop, which is amazing um, and other places. And I think once there I met people and then I just sort of held on for dear life. And I just said, stay with me, let's trade work. You know, I'll edit for you, edit for me. And, and I did have, you know, over a decade working sort of in the corporate realm, doing writing, doing uh, sort of high level writing for executives in the technology industry. And that was helpful because in a press release on a technology, it has to be very concise and it has to be factually correct. And you have to have a deep understanding of sometimes very complex and groundbreaking technologies. And that informed how I would then try to plumb the depths of human experiences. Um, when, not to say that I'm even able to do it, but but it's what I'm interested in doing. Yeah, yeah, no, of course, I get completely like it's, I can say completely what you're saying with that. So now I want to ask you next as well. Because obviously like in relation to your own works, I'm going to be moving all around the place. And that's because the way my brain thinks. But that's great. I know, obviously, like I said before, you, you, you're obviously, if people look at your website, they can see straight away. Well, you, you just don't do fiction, you do non fiction as well. And, and I want to ask you about that, obviously, that we'll just touch into non fiction first of all. Now, obviously, I know when I'm doing non fiction and I move into poetry a lot of the time as well, do you find like it's, you're operating a different switch in your brain, aren't you? Oh my goodness, yes. And and I wanted to get to your question about HuffPost too. Um, oh yes, yes. There's a typical me, I forgot. <laughs> no, this is me. I have a million thoughts in my brain. Cannot keep them working on to save my life. Um, but got to circle back. Um, well, I would say, so early on um, when I first had my kids, uh, my kids were diagnosed with an immune deficiency. It's Ooh. called common variable immune deficiency. Um, and it's a, it's a chronic lifelong condition. And then I also found out that I have lupus. And in dealing with those health challenges, I was writing a lot about it in a fictional sense. And mm. my writing partner were saying, you know, hey, have you thought about just writing this straight and just writing it about it personally? And I said, no, 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 I don't want to do this. My husband doesn't want to do this. You know, I don't want to name names. Um, but then I guess what changed for me is I realized that that maybe by naming some of my struggle uh, and being in a non-fiction capacity, maybe I could help others. Maybe other parents might read it and go, oh my gosh, there's another family who dealt with CVID, you know? And so, so that sort of helped me sort of get over my own, my own hesitance. And uh, working with HuffPost was incredible. There's a wonderful editor there, Noah Mickelson, who is um, an outspoken, amazing um, editor, especially for the LBGTQ plus community um, and is an editor for um, the personal essay uh, columns. And I highly recommend working with him. He's, he really understands the heart 
behind the issues and the writing has to be good too. And, and I'm loving actually doing some personal stuff. And, and now I'm going to give you a preview. Actually, I wrote, I wrote my, my new novel, which I'm, I'm workshopping right now at Sewanee uh, with a professor, Sadiq Bofana, who's amazing. And his, his collection is coming out um, in the year as well, but uh, it's auto fiction. And so it's really, it's sort of in the tradition of books like, um, you know, Goodbye Vitamin, um, by Rachel Kong and What We Lose uh, by Zinzi Clemens, two, two women writers um, of color who I admire so greatly. And, and it's sort of a new genre, you know, where we're saying, hey, you know, it is sort of memoir, but I wanted to take a little bit of creative liberties. I wanted my characters to not exactly be me. I wanted them to be able to do things that maybe in real life I couldn't do. Oh yeah, I know. I know you. I get you completely. Right? Excellent. No, that sounds like it's something that can really just didn't challenge that straight away. So, so straight away with that. So, and I like the word new novel. I didn't know you'd actually wrote any novels. Actually, that's why. So, so it is. I will come on to. I'll say. I want to talk about your forefront projects at the end more. But I do. I have to ask you about this since this has come up then. So, is this what your will be your first published novel then? Will it be? Or have you have other novels published? This will be the debut novel, yes. And, um, you know, I'm, I did write a novel before this book. Um, and I, I'm, you know, at some point, maybe will that one get published? I don't know. But it, it might have also been, you know, the book that I learned how to write on. You know, sometimes writers talk mm. about the, yeah. the book that sits in the desk drawer. Oh, I I've, have, got, well, I've got two of them. I've got two yeah. of them. Yep, yeah, I know. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, it's quite possible that all of my books will end up in the drawer and I, I totally had a crisis, I have to tell you, like earlier this year, because I was like, you know, I've written all this stuff and what if it never gets published? What if I never catch the eye of an agent? It's very, very hard in the US to get an agent. Um, it has to be perfect. It has to be commercially viable. And I think some of the stuff that I write sometimes is a little more artistic, um, maybe a little bit of a sl slower burn in terms of the immediate conflict on the first pages. And that's what they're looking for, you know, right away if you're an unknown. And there's a lot of pressure also on it, you know, to be, to have a perfect debut. Anyway, I have some thoughts on this, obviously, but but I do think, um, you know, that, that for me, what I had to make peace with was just the love of doing it for me. And I don't care, you know, obviously I'm a writer, the job description is for people to read it and I'd love to find readers, but I, what's more important to me is to love the work myself, to love the craft, um, to be involved with my writing community, to, to teach, um, to help others. That's, that's the gig, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I'll get a complete of it. So, and it's like, say for example, and then, Looking, obviously, you're helping the community out and back to that point again. But I wanted to know, but also want to ask you about the, but about the pub PR work you do as well. So, how do you help writers out then? And what are you looking for if you help your help writers out? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I work with with authors, and I sort of, uh, I guess, commingle my background in public relations and my background as a writer, a creative writer, um, to help authors publicize their work. And, uh, you know, Carol Orange is, is such a great example because we were so, we were so lucky that, you know, right around the same time, about a year after Carol's book, A Discerning Eye was published, which is about the Gardner uh, art theft, a Netflix docu-series came out on the same art theft. And so we were like, you know, this is a cultural moment. This is a time when there's a lot of interest in this and it's a story that hadn't been told. And I think that was Carol's genius. And, and also she was in the art world. She was, you know, going to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and it was special to her. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like she saw the documentary on, on Netflix and then decided to write about it. It really came from, you know, her place of ideas um so yeah and so i'm looking for authors who and you're you're welcome you know if you are a writer or an author who even just wants some advice contact me on my website i have a form on there um, and i'm very reasonable i'm probably too cheap but anyway um, <laughs> i like to help people you know get their work out there and and having worked for several literary journals i do think i can help point people in the right direction now that i know 
you know, some of the styles of the editors at the different journals, I could say, oh, you're writing sort of like this, or this strikes me this way, you might think about submitting it here. Um, and there's a lot of contests too, where, you know, I think people are trying to, um, trying to fund, you know, life as a creative. And so I can be, I can be helpful there or, you know, self-published authors, we can try to navigate, you know, the Amazon machine together. With, oh, with that. Oh, good luck with that. <laughs> right? It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. And it's crazy to me that Amazon started as a bookseller, you know? So interesting. When people say the book is dead, I'm like, have you seen Amazon? <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt the book is far from dead. Because you see them out of like them self-published authors that go on Amazon. And it's like, I'm not going to say it's this way, it's worth always having a contest like that me here knows what she's doing. It makes me smile. So I keep getting emails coming through from Amazon saying, you have an Amazon, you have a Kindle payment coming. And I'm thinking, what's it going to be this time? 10 pence, <laughs> 15 pence. <laughs> I know, I know. And you know what else is crazy is that a lot of self-published authors on Kindle Store make more than than writers who are going through traditional publishing. You know, and I think sometimes I, I get a there's something wrong here. <laughs> Not that it's wrong for writers to get paid, but that the fact that there are some writers who are working for decades on works that are not making a livable wage, that to me seems wrong. And I think we do have a culture that um, that doesn't appreciate art to the extent it should. And, and now we all worship the screen, you know, um, the streaming content. And a lot of books and, and poems and, and short stories flash. Even Rachel Kong has a story that's going to be a short story that's going to be made into um, a film and, and a show. But I do think that um, that writers should be able to write and, and be paid for it. I, I feel strongly and, and uh, I will make one anti-corporate plug having worked in the corporate world. And I will say, this is so important to me. This is my thesis statement. The companies like Apple and Amazon who make 30% off every transaction and didn't do any of the creative work, you know, they, I feel like they have a responsibility to pay for more support and resources for working artists who are you know they're profiting off of our work so help us help us create it yeah i agree i agree with that because um, obviously we're here to talk about you today but i do agree well it's like i'm a musician i look at the city look what you get like on streaming platforms on like spotify like i said you get so little payment on it it's infuriating really and particularly at the moment we're obviously in lockdown and both our country have been hit heavy by the virus it shows really where probably some changes need making really on things. Absolutely, yes, I, I so agree, and you're you're so so right. And uh, it just it just bothers me to think of writers and and all artists, musicians, you know, painters, anyone who's who's not getting paid properly for their work. And um, yeah, it, and I the thing that really breaks my heart too is thinking of people who maybe have a story to tell or have art to put out there who who never even get a chance to tell it. Yeah, it's really, really frustrating. All we just do is keep hoping, don't we? And everyone gets gets what they want eventually. So I've got to ask you, change topics again now. And it's, it's a good interview, this one. I'm, we're both jumping around all the time and completely yeah. bamboozling each other. Now, I know you've been finalist for a couple of award, uh, awards, and I want to ask you about the experience of these. Obviously, we're talking about one of your earlier works, um, Fight or Flight, which was a finalist for the Rick Gamaris Short Story Award. So tell us about the experience of that in 2015, first of all. Absolutely. I, I have some, some thoughts on this. So, you know, you've heard the saying, always the bridesmaid, never the bride. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think this applies to my career thus far. Um, but, you know, I think it's just part of the journey. It's part of the process is, is trying to put yourself out there, you know, climb up the ranks. Um, but one thing I will say that I wish I had done and did not know until I sort of became an editor at a literary journal is that early on when people were communicating with me or just saying, oh, hey, you know, you're a finalist for this or you're, you made it to the long list for this or whatever, I'd say, oh, thank you. And that, you know, that was sort of it, discussion ended. I was, I was super jazzed and really pleased, but I was very afraid to like jinx it or something. And I think now, I, I think what I would do is, is take that opportunity to start a conversation with that editor and be, you know, be in contact with them so much about everything, you know, hey, I'm working on this or, hey, I've got this and just try to, 
you know, try to have that be a foundational discussion. And, and some of the writers that I work with at Five South do that. And I love it. And I'm so open to it because I am a champion of their work. So I think when I was young and stupid, I sort of maybe didn't know that because I was so afraid and I was so scared. And I thought, oh, who will want to talk to little old me? I'll never email anyone. And now I kind of wish I had, you know. A lovely sense of humour as well. And it, it, it's a good example of your sense of humour here on the website here when also you go on about, is it the Molotov cocktail of 2020 when you had a piece called The Plumber which you wrote here, close but no cigar, short this shout out. And I thought, oh, I love that. <laughs> yes, I know. And, you know, the Molotov cocktail is one of the most amazing uh, outlets for flash fiction right now. That was a, a little story I wrote um, at the Kenyan Review Writers Workshop with Angie Cruz, who her book Dominicana was uh, the first Good Morning America book club of the month. Wow. Wow. Yeah, she's an amazing, love you, Angie. She's an amazing writer. She's teaching right now at Kenyon. Um, but yeah, it, 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 does, it does feel like that. Like, you know, so close, so close. Um, and, but you know what's funny? I'll tell you a story. So I was working with a, an author who has just had her print run of her new book sold out, Marsha Butler. Uh, she has a, a fantastic, her third novel. It's called Oslo, Maine. Go out and buy it. It's fantastic. It's about a moose. It's really amazing. <laughs> um, she turned me on to an editor uh, who she'd worked with. And I was checking out you know, his credentials, looking at his website. And I swear to God, this, this writer has been a finalist, you know, a hundred, a hundred times, maybe hundreds of times. And I thought, wow, you know, this is starting to look a lot like mine, you know, my CV. And we worked together um, on a few edits for my new book. And it was amazing, just amazing work, amazing editorial services. I, you know, I work with editors that I pay as well, just to, you know, find blind spots and see things. And, and I'm so glad I did. And, and what I realized from that is that you don't have to win to be good. And that so many writers, it, it's just an honor to be a runner up. It's an honor to be second place. It's an honor to be third place. I'll tell you, I, I was just an assistant judge for a contest with win winning writers. And I read 2,500 stories that were entries. Yes, it was, it was mind boggling. It was, it was actually yeah. like pretty tough. <laughs> it was really mm. tough, but I just did it a little chip away at it every day. You know, I didn't read them all at once. Every day I would read a batch of stories. And what I learned is that there's so, so many people who want to do this and everyone's stories are good and they're all great. And so it's just so competitive. You know, I mean, the, the wonderful novelist Susan Mino uh, was a finalist for narratives contest. She didn't even win. And, wow. you know, Marie Moore won the story prize, I believe, a year ago. So, so when you as, and me, as a debut writer, emerging writer, a new voice on the scene, the new kids on the block, we're competing with masters who have been doing this for decades. And so I think just your goal shouldn't be to win. Your goal should be to be in the company of. It should be to be next to. It should be in the tradition of, or like, oh my gosh, I'm in a journal with one of my heroes. You know, that's that to me says that you're making work that's at the level. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but- No, it does, yeah, it does, it does completely. It does completely with that one. So now I get you completely with that. I'm like that, I'm, every chance I meet a writer or a musician, I really, really admire. And it's like, I, I don't know about you, but if you ever meet, have you ever met one of your heroes? And you're absolutely complete tongue-tied when you meet them. Yes, yes, I do. Oh my gosh, um, Kais Lehman, who, who wrote the most astounding memoir, Heavy, was a fellow at Sewanee last summer and he gave a talk and then came to my workshop and I was so blown away. I could, I was, you know, just sort of giggling in the corner, like with my hand up, ready to ask questions and just, because that book just blew me away. And, and also that, you know, there's so many writers who are the greats, who are still alive, who are still producing, who are still working and adding to, to the canon right now. Joyce Carol Oates, she's on Twitter. Go follow Joyce Carol Oates on Twitter. Uh, it's amazing. Uh. You know, you, you have access. You know, I'm, not, I'm obviously not going to call up Joyce Carol Oates on her cell phone and, and say, how's it going? But um, she's publishing in all these little, little literary journals, you know, and so you can read her work 
Um, Joy Williams, another great one. She's on the New Yorker Fiction Podcast talking about Don DeLillo. She's still producing work. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing that, that we're living in a time with these amazing artists. So I, yeah, I feel tickled too. I'm like, I can't wait till we can fly and go to readings again and go to places. And I'm just gonna basically sit in the corner and just, uh, just try to absorb, you know, some of their, their light and their insights. Cause it's, yeah, blown away. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, same thing as well. So hopefully, obviously, like, by the time this podcast goes live, things have been lifted a lot more. So I want to keep it. It'd be fantastic to sit in the room with fellow writers and just catch the experience again. And completely with that. So now I've got to ask you, obviously, there's one more of your competitions I want to ask you about. And then we'll, there's only one or two more things I want to cover before we conclude today. But obviously, like, you were a finalist also last year, weren't you, with the Pinch Literary Award for opening day as well. I, I was, and I'm hoping that I can read a little bit of that story for you guys please. today. Please, in the second half, please, definitely, yes. <laughs> this story, and, and I'll tell you why. It's, it's the perfect, um, I guess, example of what I've been talking about the whole time, which, you know, I started the idea for this story when I was about 17 or 18 years old. And, you know, I'm quite a bit older than that now. So I would say this is a story that is right and years in I had a, a first draft and then it took me another 10 years to finish it and and I won't you know I won't say that I was working on it every day for 20 years but what happened and what's so incredible to me about the way that the mind works and the way practice works is that it took me 10 years of working on other stuff and getting better and learning how to do the craft techniques that that I always had the idea for it but 10 years later, I was able to, to put the ideas into practice in a, in a way that I wanted. And um, so I think that's all to say, like, if you have a story that's burning in you, in your chest or your mind, um, you know, it, it might take a while to come out and it might surprise you, but it might be, you know, it might be the most amazing thing ever. And that's okay. I guess I just wanted to say, like, give yourself permission you know, we live in, in America, certainly there's this culture of immediacy, this culture of now and on social media, it's like, you better tweet today and gone tomorrow, you know, and you're canceled and you're canceled. And it's like, no, 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 no. Like, yes, people do despicable things and, and, that, and that's a whole separate issue. Um, but, you know, we have free speech and, and it may take you 50 years to write something or to, to paint something or to, to make a song that's, that moves someone. And I say, take the time because that's what's valuable. It's, you know, they say Rome wasn't built in a day and it's like, well, how good is a piece of art if you, if you do it in an afternoon and dash it off? That's not gonna mean anything to anyone. What's the point? The point is, I think, to spend the 20 years and try to get it to something that, that will leave, hopefully, your audience with a feeling or, or something new or, you know, like, I guess if I read a story that I like or see a movie I like or a song that I love, I'll think about it for weeks after years and, and I'll wanna read it again. And that's, uh, that's what I think the goal is of, of the modern artist. Yeah, no, I agree completely with that. I think it's a great way of finishing off this chat, actually. So we'll come on to the last two questions now for you. I'll let you do the heavy plugs for yourself now. If people want to find out more about you, Nina, where are the best going, first of all? Ah, that's wonderful. Um, well, you can definitely visit me on my website. It's just ninamanchester.com. And it's a funny name because I'm half Finnish and half Norwegian American. So it's M. Oh, you know it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I was wondering why. <laughs> yeah, for this, see about the names. I thought, I thought it was a usual combo. That's straight away. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, and and actually, that's um, that's what I'm interested in writing about too. And my themes is you know Scandinavian American uh, communities and families. So yeah, visit the website. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I, after my whole diatribe about social media and how horrible it is, come visit me there. But no, I'm I'm open for DMs. Um, I I'd love to talk with you all. Um, and you know, th this stuff is really it's what I'm most passionate about in my life. It, for me to be able to make and create is, is the greatest privilege of being alive. So, um, you know, of course, if you're a weirdo, <laughs> don't, don't, <laughs> I don't, don't you know. get blocked. But, uh, <laughs> yep, yep. But, it, but it, um, you know, if you really do have an interest in this stuff, it just, just want to connect. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. 
Brilliant. Now, I've actually asked the questions the wrong way around. So what I normally ask before, let you tell people where they can find you is, do you have any plans for the future you can reveal? So right now I am I'm working very seriously on to, on a major revision to, to my debut novel, working on that. And I also have a short story collection that I'm working on. So time will tell which one will be sort of first, I guess. Um, I think some, you know, about half of the short stories in the collection have been published or are finalists <laughs> for things. Yeah. So, you know, I I think there's this thing with writers where we always say the short story is practice for the book, you know, and everyone just wants the book, they want the novel. I think with writers like Daniel Evans, who, who just wrote um, the most amazing story collection, just won the Joyce Carol Oates Prize actually, um, I think that's changing. And I think that's a good thing. I think we have more, um, more of a market for short stories. So I'm excited, you know, and I, I think for me in my journey, I'm looking to work with agents and editors who will see me as a full artist and not pigeonhole me. And they'll say, okay, yeah, short stories, cool. Flash, cool. Novels, cool. Uh, nonfiction about <laughs> your sick kids, cool. You know, and like maybe in the future, I don't know, maybe I'll write a genre novel, like maybe a detective mystery, or maybe I'll do a speculative thing. So I just wanna, I wanna have that freedom for myself uh, you know, I'm, I always tell people I'm very greedy. I want it all. And I, I really want it. And you want it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll wait. I'll wait. But I want it all. <laughs> Brilliant. I think that's a great way to finish off that, this part, Nina. So I know you're going to do some readings in the second half, but I've really enjoyed this today. It's been a fascinating chat. Learning about it gives everything to good, everything good, the emphasis on it about how to look what how things that operate behind the scenes as well so and it shows you that like, yeah, how you counterbalance everything you, you got your fingers in so many pies and you're a full-time mum as well that makes it even more incredible that's oh, why so i i mean you should see me in the morning <laughs> and who knows <laughs> who knows what my kids will say they're always like oh another writer friend you know and i'm like yeah i know <laughs> but oh. you know i think kids well, you know, a lot of moms say this, but that kids need to see you modeling what you want for them. And, uh, you know, I love to read to them. So it's sort of a natural thing. It's like we sit down every day at bedtime and another book, mom, another book, you know. I think it's right. You've done the right thing, really, that because it's, I know I've got, I've got, a, I've got a nephew who's under 14 now, and he's an incredibly intelligent young man. He's taller than me as well, and I'm six foot one. That's <laughs> scary. But like it was like my sister. Like your sister is a very, very big reader, and this is where applied the same for you, really. Is like she's always read to him from a very early age, and even like and even now, like he's he's still a young man now, nearly. She still reads to him sometimes. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, I love that image of the two of them reading. Yeah. You know, this tall, tall boy man at fourteen, uh, adolescence young man, and um, I love that. I mean, and I also think you know, as a child who was read to, um, it. it it gives you with an imagination and that is such a gift. Um, so I, I think, yes, we should all read. We should, you know, yeah. stories, you know, it's, yeah. it's beautiful. You thing. do. You do like it as an, I've, I've, I've said before to you, obviously like my partner is a writer as well. And we're often bouncing ideas off each other. And it's, I think if you've got somebody you can talk to about ideas and read to them, it makes you more, I think, more of a deeper thinker. I think that's a good thing as a writer. Yes. Yes. Right, anyway, we'll digress completely here. So we'll we'll wrap up now, Mina. So thank you for this first half and brilliant chat. I've really enjoyed this. So we'll we'll pause the recording and let you get composed and do some reading for us. Right. Thank you again. See you all in a minute, guys. Spoken oh, life. Hi guys. Still here with Mina, and now she's going to read out an extract from your short stories, Mina, aren't you? So over to you, my friend. Thank you so much, Andy. I'm going to read you just a little bit of an excerpt from my story, Opening Day, which was a finalist for the Pinch Literary Award in 2020. Pick a lake, Jen said. I unfolded the map, running my index finger across the tiny lines in different colors, trying to figure out which were roads and which were rivers. There are a ton of lakes on here. Pick whichever one you want, as long as the map says you can fish, she said. Can I have a candy bar, Anthony said. Only if you get one for everybody else, Jen said. I couldn't locate where our cabin was on the map, but I found the town it was in. There was only one lake near the cabin and it wasn't any good for fishing. It was a big lake used mostly for water skiing and swimming. 
There was a large picnic area and huge caramel colored sandy beach my grandma liked to spend the day at. I hunted for small lakes, but not too small because even I knew that big fish don't swim in small lakes. I started rattling off names, Pine Lake, Lone Lake, Teardrop Lake. Jen nodded in time to the music, tapping her thick fingers on the leather wrapped steering wheel. I pictured her grip on a large softball. It wasn't hard to imagine. She told anyone who asked, and people asked a lot how tall she was. 5'12", she always said. Usually, the person asking was taken aback, and in the time it took them to do the math, they realized they'd been had. Jen and I had the same stringy dishwater colored hair. She always pulled hers back into a plastic clip she bought at the drugstore, then shoved the whole mess under a beaten up baseball cap. I don't think she did laundry much, but she never smelled bad or anything. If fresh fish had a smell, that was hers, like flesh mixed with salt water. She wasn't fat, but her shoulders were huge, such as an albatross. And while a tomboyish woman who looked as though she were a linebacker and settled other people, I felt safe and protected by how much physical space she took up. The albatross is the only creature capable of flying over the earth in its entirety. Jen's lack of a job and general carelessness about her appearance and apparent disregard for getting married and having a family made me feel like it was okay to be who I was which was good because I was a pretty strange bird myself and didn't think anyone would choose me anyway. At the time, while I was stuck in school and after curriculars, including French and clarinet lessons and the dreaded soccer practice, all I wanted was Jen's absence of responsibilities. But now I see all the things she didn't have and the cost of her freedom. While I was growing up to pass the time and try to earn enough money to stay unemployed, and I think now to distract herself from the memories that troubled her, Jen was forever coming up with get-rich-quick schemes that she enlisted my help on. There was the time she decided to make artisanal jam. She said she'd gotten the brainstorm driving by a farm stand and realized strawberries and mason jars were cheap, so there was a big profit margin. After she procured the necessary supplies with my grandmother's money, we spent an entire afternoon listening to Bob Marley and turning my parents' kitchen into a sticky mess before my mom finally came home and helped us figure out how to properly seal the jars. Eventually, Jen lost money on that endeavor and we ended up handing them out as Christmas gifts. But every time I eat dry toast, I think of that afternoon. Then there was the time Jen signed up to deliver the neighborhood yellow pages. She had the whole trunk of her Suburban filled with them. And if you've never been in a Suburban from the late nineties, you don't know how enormous they are. I'd never been as tired as those few days when we carried heavy phone books up every driveway in Ballard. I don't think she made any money on that deal either. We both decided it was too much work for too little reward. No, mostly what Jen ended up doing was watching us kids. And while she didn't make any money on that, she enjoyed it because she could be her true self around us without judgment. Target Lake, that's the one, where is it? I studied the bar scale on the map, trying to estimate the distance. It's about two fingers away from the cabin, I said. Jen must have thought my little kid fingers were small, so she said that's the one again. However, my fingers have always been abnormally long. Piano player's hands, my mom always said, even though I don't play. Jen's eyes shone with mirth as she pulled the Suburban into the dirt driveway of the cabin. Her face looked all scrunched up like there was something wrong with her. And certainly there was, because why else would she have all those wrinkles? She wasn't that old. In truth, she was 35, the same age I am now. However, she spent all her time outside in the sun, fishing and drinking, so her face was weathered. Sometimes I think Jen had it all right, that life is really all about the present moment. Being truly aware of it while you're still in it is a skill so few have. Usually, people who figure this out don't live long. It's as if they've already learned everything, so they skip some grades and graduate early. I think in Jen's case, living in the moment was the way she coped with the sexual abuse she'd suffered at the hands of her father's friend when she was a little girl. I only learned about it later, after she died, when I overheard my parents talking. Let's get there at midnight. In that instant, I knew exactly what Jen was planning. She didn't have to spell it all out for me. We'd be the first people to fish the lake. At midnight, we'd be the only ones there. All the fish who'd been fattening themselves up for the last year were ours for the taking. Let's get a few hours of sleep before we head out. I'll wake everyone up. But why don't you set an alarm just in case? I turned my attention to setting an alarm on the digital watch I'd gotten for my birthday. What are we going to need? Jen said. 
In the high desert with only small foothills and plateaus around to protect us from the wind, I figured we'd need blankets, warm coats, and hats. Let's bring a thermos of hot chocolate, I said. How about I put you in charge of the cooler? Sounds good. We need chips and gummy bears, maybe some chocolate, granola bars, water bottles, and flashlights, and the camping chairs. I wrote everything down in my journal. I thought I'd thought of everything. Jen, of course, being a minimalist, only needed a few essentials. Her fishing pole, tackle box, pack of smokes, a bottle of vodka, and a six pack of beer for good measure. Predictably, at a quarter to midnight, Jen did not wake up. When my watch went off, I rubbed my eyes, which were dry from the elevation, and went to wake her up. Jen awoke all at once as if she'd been startled by a loud noise or someone hitting her, not me gently rubbing her arm. She looked around wildly in the dark and only calmed down when she saw me standing there. I wondered about her nightmares then and the thought of them haunting her stays with me now. I reminded her of our plan and she sprang slowly into action. She went into the bunk room and woke up the boys. Immediately, they started wrestling and fighting. I found them so tiresome. Who would be first? Who was stronger? Who got to sit next to Jen in the car? It was constant and irritating. Can I wear my pajamas? Davy said. Sure thing, Jen said. Can I wear my pajamas too? Anthony said. Why not? Let's all wear our pajamas. Jen laughed, throwing her head back in a full cackle. She looked like a witch when she did this, and I never knew if I should be afraid or not. Ignoring them, I set to work gathering the supplies. I'm always happiest when I have a job, something to set my mind to. My anxiety tends to get the better of me sometimes, so I need to focus on tasks to distract myself. Everyone in my family thinks I'm smart and I have a good emotional IQ and all that, but on the inside, I prefer being alone and having quiet thoughts. I think Jen understood this without having to talk about it. She always let me be. Can you help me load the car? I asked Anthony. I never asked Davy for anything. He was too little to be helpful. I handed Anthony our things one by one. I like to be prepared and pretty much throw the contents of the whole house into the car whenever I go somewhere. This is why I've stopped going as many places. It's just too much effort. But anyway, Anthony and I stacked wool blankets, sleeping bags, camping chairs, coolers, flashlights, a lantern, a net, Jen's tackle box, and four fishing poles in the back of the Suburban. Then I threw in some library books I was in the middle of in case things got boring and I needed to check out for a while and a battery operated radio. The map was still in the front seat, and by the time Jen got back into her pajamas and we wrangled the boys into the car, every single light in the cabin was on, and I thought we'd wake the neighbors up until I remembered we were far out in the country and there weren't any other people around for miles. I sat shotgun as usual, and it wasn't very cold, so I rolled my window down and stuck my head out while Jen piloted us down the hill from the cabin to the highway. Heading down the road, warm and safe in the suburban loaded with supplies, I felt free in the way you only can in childhood. My eyes adjusted to the dark. It was flat calm without all the lights from the city and the cars and trucks and stores and people everywhere. Despite the quiet, the night was surprisingly alive. Huge white moths flew toward our headlights, glowing yellow, lit from underneath. Here, the trees that bent their heads over the highway were different than at home. Mountain alder and paper birch leaves rustled as we drove by. Jen was a very accomplished driver. She drove often and alcohol didn't impair her skills much. She was used to it, I guess, or maybe the whole world looked a bit fuzzy around the edges to her. I love how she drove, just fast enough to feel like you were going somewhere, but slow enough to enjoy the view. Searching for deer, I kept my eyes trained on the road ahead. Deer and logging trucks were the two things we were afraid of. When we drove over the old rickety narrow wooden bridge on the side road out of town, I was nervous it would collapse right under us, so I sucked in my breath and held on to it. As we drove, I thought I detected the slight shadows of bat wings darkening over the windshield every once in a while, but I didn't hear any owls, even though their numbers were high that spring. It was one of the rare springs where there hadn't been much of a drought, so even though the rainfall wasn't exactly plentiful, the earth wasn't all dried up either. I was happy we were going to a lake because being around water always makes me relaxed. Swimming in a glacial lake is just about as good as it gets. I like how the freezing cold water makes everything clear and illuminated, and you can see where all the rocks are without having to guess. I like how the sun beats straight down on your skin during the hottest part of the day. You don't even feel cold anymore. You just feel warm inside, like how it is when you know somebody loves you. Being able to swim in lakes other people deem too cold makes me feel brave and good at something two things I don't feel very often. 
I guess the truth is the older I get, the more I realize how hard it is to be anything without contradictions. But at the time, as I intimated, some kids were giving me a rough time at school because I didn't fit in being as I wasn't all that physically attractive and was bookish and all. And also my family was rumored to be wealthy when in fact we weren't. And I didn't want people to like me for that reason anyway. All the people I've ever known who had a ton of money, I never got along with too well. As I've gotten older, I've realized I like people who've had to try a little harder. People with metal. I like to see that behind the exterior defenses we all put up, underneath there's something real. Maybe something authentic only to them, something they learned or decided a long time ago meant something to them. Usually, you find these sorts of things out about yourself after going through something hard. Maybe in some people, these are deemed eccentricities, but they don't have to be. Most people with metal are still able to function in normal society and get along with people and all. For Jen, that was not the case. But then again, as I said, she was not like other people. We kept driving along windy roads that went up and down small hills. The road switched back and forth so many times around the surrounding lands that when we were on one part, I looked back and saw the part we'd just been on. It reminded me of a snake, the way their bodies switched back on themselves. It was all one road, even though on the map, they looked like different ones. Where are we, Jen said. We'd been driving for maybe 45 minutes or an hour. I was supposed to be in charge of where we were going and I had no idea. Turning on the overhead light, I consulted the map. I ran my finger over a wide swath where I thought we might be. We had passed a few lakes, but it was dark. So I couldn't really tell which ones they were by their shape. Out this far, there weren't street signs or anything like that. In the suburbs, it seemed like every road had about three signs telling you everything about it, warning you not to park there, that it didn't go through, it was a dead end, etc. Out here, we were on our own. Jen's disco cassette hit the end and she turned on the radio. We heard music I wasn't familiar with. Country music, I guess. It was nice, slow, and real, with a beat to it still. It wasn't like all the pop country music they play now, where every single damn song has the same lyrics about trucks and whiskey and ex-girlfriends. No. This music reached right in and instructed you to sit down while it told you something true, maybe about yourself or maybe about life. I listened intently, hoping to hear something that would help me make sense of it all. We drove for a lot longer. I didn't know how much gas the Suburban had to start with, but Jen eventually looked down and said we only had a sliver of a tank left. At that moment, it seemed for the first time, Jen was feeling a little scared we might be lost. Here she was in the middle of nowhere with all these kids in the dark in their pajamas and all she wanted to do was go fishing. Well, let's just pick the first lake we see next, she said. It was as though Jen had a premonition. Maybe all the bad things that happened to her when she was little turned into karmic retribution laying down a gentle hand because in the next minute, we came upon the perfectly sized lake we've been searching for all along. Whether it was Target Lake or not, I've never tried to find out because in my heart of hearts, I've always known it was. I wasn't worried then about finding our way home and it didn't seem like Jen was either, because as soon as she spotted the lake, she was energized as if she could fly to the moon. Jen parked right off the road, and wouldn't you know it, there was a short, flat path, perfectly walkable for small children, right to the lake's edge. She threw back the doors of the suburban and started tossing stuff on the ground in a heap. I helped set everything up, which wasn't hard to do, because the chairs were the simple aluminum folding kinds, and then we started getting all the poles ready. We spent a joyous half an hour or so just picking out our bait and loading our hooks with preposterous looking concoctions we were sure the fish would bite on right away, seeing as they hadn't seen anything like it in months. Above us, the night sky glittered with stars. Have you ever noticed that when you first go outside in the dark, you can't see much, but after a while, it's as though your eyes open in a whole new way and you can see absolutely everything, even clearer than in the day? That's what it was like. I don't even remember there being a moon, but there probably was. I was just a kid. and You don't always remember to look up when you're little. If there was a moon, it was probably a bit bleary and high, high up in the sky, because outside of the city, where the earth is in its most natural form, the sky is bigger and it stretches out. It's not all compacted into small squares between buildings and power lines and all, where you can only see tiny snatches at a time. I do remember the night sky was colored mostly in inky black with a bit of blue in it at the edges, like these India ink paintings we did once in art class. And I thought the blue looked hopeful because morning was on its way. We got everything ready. Maybe Jen was drinking. Maybe she was even drunk. I really don't know. 
All I know is we made an absolute killing and it was so fun I had a blast and no one cared that I was the only one not wearing my pajamas and I was reading a library book under a blanket with a flashlight because I don't really like to fish that much. When Davy eventually got tired and cranky because he was too young to catch a fish, somehow secretly evading anyone's watchful eyes, especially mine, Jen caught a baby fish and kept it alive long enough to hook it onto Davy's pole. When he reeled that fish in, it didn't matter that we got truly lost on the way home and I worried I'd have to drive the way Jen was swerving. And then we ran out of gas and had to walk the rest of the way back. As it turned out, what Jen did for Davy is what sticks with me because this was our last adventure. I went back to school when we returned to the city and then was shipped off to Girl Scout camp for the summer. The fall went by in a blur of increasingly dramatic winter storms and my newfound interest in musical theater. And then right before Christmas, a local fisherman found Jen's boat. Her body washed up on the shore near our house a week later. I often wonder what Jen thought about during those hours in the water and what it was that finally sent her under after she fought so hard to survive. Thank you. Tremendous, absolute tremendous. It felt like we'd gone, we'd gone for a full life in that, that short extract then. I'd have, I'd, have been, I'd have been exhausted reading all that. So I mean, it was a respect to you then, Mina. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you listening and giving me the chance uh, to read. Thank you. And tremendous out today. So I've really, really enjoyed it. So thank you today, Mina. Hang around. I do need to speak to you off mic anyway. But it's been a pleasure today. Really has Great. been a pleasure. So take care, guys and girls. As Don Khan and Don Callis says at Impact Wrestling, stay safe and stay over. And we'll see you all next time. Spoken, mate. <laughs>